Hi, welcome to today's upload and welcome to worship. I hope you find value in this. My name is Gary Gotham and I'm a United Reformed Church minister serving in the southwest of England. This week we're challenged to recognise the immediacy of faith and to respond accordingly. Speaking of immediacy, if you're watching this as it premieres on YouTube, why not say hello in the chat feed to the right of the screen? It all helps us to build that sense that we're joining and participating together rather than being remote individual viewers. So find the live chat, say hello and don't be shy. In a week when President Biden got straight to work making significant changes on day one, we read of Jesus talking in the present tense a lot. Everything is about now. The fishermen he calls respond immediately, now. What a radical difference to the many usual approaches to faith and life, traditions from the past, planning and consulting for the future. This is about God calling us to action in the here and now. So who is called to our worship? All are called. Young and old are called. Poor and rich are called. Wise and foolish are called. Weak and strong called. Faithful and doubting called. All are called to worship today. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we're here today, not because we must, but because we may. We gather because we need to hear something more life-affirming than the endless stream of news, views, likes and shares. We long for depth. We long for significance and meaning. We long to become the people you would have us be. Creator God, in the beginning, your voice spoke creation into existence. Your creative word kick-started the becoming of everything from nothing. You brought humankind into existence, not leaving us to drift, but inviting us into relationship with you. You spoke to us then, and you speak to us still. Divine word, throughout history your voice has come to us through holy women and men, and by the written word. In the most amazing communication of all, you came to us in the person of Jesus, your living word, and you continue to speak to us today. So silence in us any voice but your own, that we might hear what you have to say to each of us. God of human communion and relationships, one of your prophets, Martin Luther King Jr., once said that we can live together as brothers or perish together as fools. In this week of prayer for Christian unity, help us to remember that our words can unite or separate us. Open our hearts, eyes and ears to comprehend fully that as Christians we have more to unite us than to divide us. Lord, we are attentive and we wait upon you. Unite us now in prayer as we share the prayer that Christ gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As Jesus begins to talk with folks about God, he asks a group of fishermen to join him and immediately they say yes, no hesitation. Their courage and trust is life-changing. Jesus offers to take their skills and use them for kingdom building. Could I respond so quickly to so direct a call upon me? Could you? Have you experienced God redeploying your skills? What does it mean to respond to Jesus without hesitation? Let's hear the reading in full. I'm reading from the Gospel according to St Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. The calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake 
for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Amen. So this week the news has been dominated by Joe Biden's inauguration as the 46th President of the United States. The press has been full of cries of a new dawn, calls for unity, except for the one newspaper that I read that boldly stated on its front page, goodbye grumpy, hello sleepy. And while it must have been said in jest, there's a genuine hope from many that after four years of turmoil, of truth being called fake news, lies being alternative facts, there might be what some have called a return to politics being boring. But here's the thing, after more than four years, if you count the election run-up, which always feels like it takes months and months in the US, after more than four years of aggression, of division and the normalisation of violence, the United States has now chosen a different way. It hasn't chosen to go back to how it was. Biden ran on a ticket of unity, of bringing people together, of working for the whole country, whatever their voting record. And he chose Vice President Harris, the first woman vice president, the first black vice president, the first South Asian American vice president. Hardly a return to business as usual. Now, for some bright vice presidents, the remit means holding a job you hope you will never be needed for, that of being permanently on standby to replace the president should they become incapacitated. One of the vice presidents in the early 20th century is said to have said, every day I ring the doorbell at the White House and hope the president will answer. So it's not a role to take lightly. Nine of the country's 45 presidents have left office before the end of their term, eight by death about one in five giving vice presidents a sudden promotion. At 78 years old, Mr. Biden is the oldest president to assume the office, putting added stress on his next in line. And she is 56. So Biden, business as usual? Hmm. And vice President Harris, business as usual? Hmm. She has one of the most liberal voting records in the US Senate, pursuing progressive causes like gay rights, immigration, the legalisation of marijuana and of gun control. But before you think she's all airy-fairy, she also has an extensive legal resume, having served as California's top lawyer before her Senate bid. Her legal experience and advocacy for police reform will be useful in a White House that has promised to address systemic misconduct in US police forces. Last summer, Amid a wave of Black Lives Matter protests, Ms. Harris was a vocal supporter of the demonstrations and called for a reimagining of US policing. So back to business as usual? I don't think so. What's that got to do with our reading? Well, it's that thing about change and immediacy. Everything I've seen about this transition of power in the United States has shown that despite the outgoing president's best efforts to slow or even stop events, the new team has hit the ground running, seeking to make as many significant changes as quickly as possible. By the simple act of who he has surrounded himself with, he has indicated that more changes are to come very soon. I think Jesus was very much someone who dwelled in the moment because he was secure in where he came from and who he was ultimately, he could devote his energies to inhabiting the moment and that proved to be hugely attractive. In the story, he was just passing the Sea of Galilee when he called the fishermen. They left the tools of their trade, nets and boats, exactly where they were and followed Jesus. I feel sorry for Zebedee who was left with the hired men in the boat. I bet he was less than impressed with having to sort things out. But meeting Jesus has that sort of an impact. He is immediate, respond or don't, but there's no ignoring him. Okay, 
let's recross the Atlantic to something closer to my heart, Marmite. Alan Jope, the Scottish-born chief executive of Marmite's parent company Unilever, says customers want to buy products with good credentials and that this desire has only increased during the pandemic. Mr Jope's comments suggest that the next consumer battlegrounds might not be around price, although I'm sure that will always remain important, might not be around convenience or range of product, but around environmental and social considerations. The Marmite maker Unilever is to insist suppliers pay the living wage. Unilever has said that by 2030 it will refuse to do business with any firm that does not pay at least a living wage or income to its staff. The consumer goods giant defined a living wage as one that covered a family's basic needs and helped them break the cycle of poverty. I put a link to the Living Wage Foundation in the description down below if you'd like to discover more. Unilever says it wanted to raise wages for people outside of its own workforce in order to promote economic inclusion. Unilever is one of the first big companies to make such a commitment, a commitment that Oxfam says is a step in the right direction. They want to get ahead of the trend and plan to do well by doing good. So tell me down in the comments down below, does this resonate with you? Have you tried to buy products with good credentials more often during the pandemic? Maybe it's shopping for organic foods or fairly traded products. Maybe it's increasing your fruit and veg intake and cutting back on meat. And no, wine and beer do not count as fruit and veg products. Maybe it's supporting local businesses or British farmers by buying products with the red tractor on it, the symbol of assured farming standards. How did you get on? What helped or hindered you in your shopping? Where did you shop? Will you be doing it again? Let's get a conversation started. So tell me your thoughts in the comments section down below. Again, what's this got to do with the reading? It's that change and immediacy again. Buying better is an example of an immediate change that I, you, we can make to improve the lives of others. We've started 2021 in the UK in lockdown number three during a time of global disruption. Everyone's lives are being affected across the globe. We're being forced to live differently. Now every morning I walk my daughter to school and on the way home, before I dive into the rest of the day, I walk all the way around the town in which I live. Now don't worry, that might sound like a long walk, but it isn't. I live in what must be the tiniest town on earth. Anyway, it's the nearest I get to exercise. But as I'm wandering along, I get to see the town through different eyes, as it were. I'm not driving or cycling, I'm just walking. So there's time to look, to really see, and to wonder as I wander. To pray a little, to listen, to observe, with my ears and eyes and my heart. I sense how town is quieter than usual, on pause, waiting almost, waiting for the better times to come, the longer, warmer days, the safer days, the vaccine, the unlocking, the easing. Now pausing and disruption can be pivotal. Jesus brought it to people, the people that he called, a time to reflect, a time to learn new skills, to adapt, and a time to change. Let's embrace the good examples of change that have happened to us during COVID. This isn't to trivialise the loss and pain that people are feeling, but it is to look to the horizon and to see what might emerge. Personally, I want to carry on walking and chatting when I meet somebody I know, rather than sitting in a coffee shop. And I want to continue to use video conferencing for at least some of my future meetings. In my work, we'll think twice before we drive or catch a train to regional events, saving the planet and travelling less because we know that for some of our meetings we can use Zoom or whatever other platform. What new habit or way of working do you want to keep? Tell me in the comments below. In fact, so much can become global from our laptops and tablets and phones 
as those in other countries become as close digitally as the person who lives in the next town. And church is no different. We remember way back in history, there were people who were reluctant to meet others from a different town or village, or to voyage across the seas to new lands. Well, now we can cross those boundaries and borders, but even more so, we can do it digitally. The same, but different. Churches are moving through a period of transition, during a time of disruption. We want to hold on to what is good about church, at the same time as adapting to the future. Your partnership in this channel is an example of that and is as vital as ever as we go forward together. If you have got value from this video and haven't done so already, please consider subscribing by clicking that red subscribe button down below so that as part of something bigger, we can stretch and go further. Will you pray for the many other people that will come to watch these videos? Now, in some traditions, in Christianity, late January in the church calendar is associated with the colour green. Those churches might have green altar covers, or the clergy might wear green outer layers or vestments as they're called when leading formal acts of worship. The suggested emphasis is that of growing, just as in the Northern Hemisphere our climate is beginning to show signs of fresh growth, so you and I as God's children are encouraged to keep growing in our experience and understanding of faith. In the Gospel, Jesus calls the disciples, and even though they often messed up, they stuck at it and grew as they walked with God. God is calling us to grow. At some stages in life, we're busy growing taller. During COVID lockdown, I found it's easier to grow outwards. <clears throat> Sometimes we're challenged to grow our minds, and always we are growing our hearts as we see our neighbours and we reach out and we love as God loves us. We're called to grow in that love every single day. In today's reading, we have to recognise that that call is immediate. Jesus calls, the fishermen respond. They don't check their diaries or kitchen calendars, they don't formulate a plan, they don't go on a training course. I'm not saying none of those things are necessary in today's joined up and complex world, but what is primary is the immediate response, the yes. The beautiful part is God's love for us is infinite, beyond our comprehension, our imagining. God's love for us is always yes, always unconditional. The only question is what and when is our response to that? Now, if you follow the channel, You'll remember that last week we watched Nathaniel discover God right here, right now in front of him, and that caused his view of things to change. His closed mind was opened, challenged to think differently, to view the world differently, to view those around him differently. If right here is where we meet God, then right now is the only time to respond to him. Not rue the missed opportunities, or think about doing something tomorrow, next week, or after I've been on a course, but now. Is God remote and you and I free to put off our response? Or is God here and now? James Baldwin said, there is never a time in the future in which we will work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment. The time is always now. Now, if you want to make a response, I've suggested several ways already. Can you buy better, changing the lives of others via your shopping choices? Can you identify a positive from these COVID times that you can carry forward? Can you pray for the people that watch these videos that they can sense God's love in their lives? And are you open to God right here and now, challenging you in some real and tangible way? Let's take a couple of moments to reflect and then to respond.
Let's unite in worship with the hymn, Breathe On Me, Breath of God. Let us pray. Thank you, Creator God, for creation around us, for the peoples of the world and the lives that we enjoy. We pray for wisdom to use all that we have wisely, caring for the planet and for the lives of all people, especially those affected by famine, war and Covid. Thank you, Healing God, for the care we receive from all who work in surgeries and hospitals, those inoculating and those manufacturing and distributing vaccines. We pray for those in need, for the sick and for the bereaved, for all whom we long to see transformed by the power of your Spirit. Thank you God for science and technology, for the arts and culture, for all that takes us on voyages of curiosity and wonder and in doing so makes this world a beautiful and better place. Thank you, God of love, for the places in which we live and have our being. We pray that by our choices, we will make a difference in the lives of our families, friends and neighbours. Thank you, ever-present love. May your love for us compel us to respond to you and the world around us positively. Help us to see and act, to hear and follow, to trust and to step up. God, who we trust with our greatest hopes and fears, hear our prayers, both spoken aloud and those in our hearts, and in your mercy bring all into your presence. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Abba Father, let me be yours and yours alone. What a response to the God who calls us.
for the blessing. Time is running out. God is waiting. The kingdom of God is coming among us. May God give us the gifts of the Spirit until the whole world and everything in it, great and small, knows God and follows Christ. Amen. If you got value from this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up down below. And if you haven't, be sure to click the thumbs down button twice. And if you haven't already, I'd welcome your comments. I read them all and I always try to reply. And until the next one, stay safe and live love.